Welcome to Bad Ideas, the show where we look at misfires, mistakes, and miscalculations from all throughout histories. I'm Tony Southcott. And I'm Albert Berg. What's our bad idea for this week, Tony? Our bad idea this week is actually about the disco demolition. It's it's basically the night that disco died on the field of the White Sox home stadium, Comiskey Park, in the late 70s. I'm, I am intrigued. All right, so... Basically, this started out as Bill Veck, one of the more noted people that's ever owned a baseball team. He was He's one of the only ones that's enshrined at Cooperstown, and he was all about having bizarre nights whenever his teams weren't very good. He had circus performances, hot air balloon showings, burning limbo dancers, and so many other things just to make sure that people would show up to these games. He was thought of the, B, uh, the P.T. Barnum of baseball. He said that you can draw more people with a losing team plus bread and circuses than with a losing team and a long, still silence. And that's a very good idea, especially because baseball isn't exactly the most high, like, the, the most high-speed game out there. So you got to give people a little bit extra, especially if they're coming out there to watch a team lose. I can see that. I definitely could see getting into this. Yeah, and at this time, the, the White Sox weren't doing that great. Like, the attendance was around five to 10,000 per game in a 40,000-capacity stadium. So they were they were looking for different promotions to kind of get some some things going here. Does he say? I, I know this isn't the topic of the conversation, but the burning limbo dancers in the paragraph here really has me distracted. Were they? <laughs> this wasn't like a, a limbo dancer immolation ceremony or anything, was it? No, I'm sure this they was were safe. A burning bar that the limbo oh. people had to go under, and it was super low, like eight inches or something like that. Like, uh, ESPN had a nice little mini documentary about this particular night and uh, the different antics that they would pull over at this stadium, and it was really interesting to see. Like, I, there were a bunch of other things I could have mentioned, but the whole burning limbo dancer thing was uh, was one that stuck out to me, too. <laughs> So I, I, already I'm seeing some bad ideas in here. What is uh, What was the bad idea that led us to this episode? The bad idea was deciding that blowing up disco to help sell tickets could lead to anything but disaster. When you say blowing up disco, what, what do you mean? Well, for this particular night, anyone who brought in a disco uh, record would be able to get a ticket for 98 cents, which is about three fifty in today's dollars. So you're automatically getting in for a really cheap price. They're also having 90 cent beer. So if you go there, cheap now beer. Now that's a bad idea. Yeah, really cheap beer. There's a, there's only been f- a few forfeits in all of Major League Baseball history, and almost all of them since 1970 have been related to cheap beer nights. I'm thinking there's a little bit of a correlation there, but we'll get into the math on that a little bit later. Okay. Essentially, Steve Dahl, uh, one of the equivalents of the modern shock jock, like uh, those really brash in the morning crews or Howard Stern or those types of people, like he was one of the first ones that actually uh, did that on the radio. He came up with a promotion that he thought could get people in the door of the stadium. He ran a rock station in Chicago that held a clear vendetta against uh, against disco, which this was a personal thing to him because he had a his first major radio show was Steve Dahl's Rude Awakening, and that got canceled when the radio station switched from rock to disco. So automatically, he's got a big vendetta against it. I was thinking they would go the other way, but that's interesting. So they're uh, this was sort of coming off the height of disco's popularity yeah like it was it was kind of at the height and there's there's a lot of really weird things that killed disco part of it was a little bit of uh homophobia where people started associating disco with the gay scene but there's there's a lot that went into it as well beyond that okay but uh he noticed that there was kind of a rising sentiment against the genre and decided that he would pitch a promotion to the white Sox ownership in which they would fill a crate and blow it up uh between a double header between the Reds are the White Sox and the Detroit Tigers. So the thing here is fans are going to bring in their records. They're their 78 LPs or maybe some 45s and they're going to throw them in a big box and it's going to explode. Yeah. They're going to rig it up with charges in the middle of the field. And between the two games, they're going to blow it up. All right. And for those of you that don't know, a double header is basically where uh, the, the team goes out, they play a game early, then they go play a second game right afterwards. Usually there's like a half hour to an hour break between. It's something that happens more in baseball because of rain cancellations and things like that. Very few people thought that this would work to get 
uh, people in the door, it might break an extra 5,000. Like, they might get up to 20,000 people in the stadium, but it would still look empty, and it would be a promotion that really didn't help the radio station or the White Sox. Turns out that there was a much larger audience wanting to kill Disco than people originally thought, because this 45,000 capacity stadium swelled up to over 70,000 people. People were literally climbing the walls and sneaking into the stadium just to get in to see this happen. Okay. That's uh that's crazy. Yeah. Like it was call the fire marshal might have had something to say about that. Yeah, I'm sure that they did. Uh, any pictures that I found of this like the I, the stands were overloaded behind the stands in the hallways where like vendors and everything were, were completely overloaded. There were parts where they were just bringing a keg to the bottom of the stand so that they could pump beers and hand them out to people instead of having them go through concessions or having like a single beer guy bring cans and stuff out there. Like they were just having to do so much to deal with this crowd. And the, the video that ESPN had, like you saw people going up like 10 foot walls. Like they made like human chains and stacked each other up just so they could climb these walls and get into the stadium. I'm looking at some pictures now, and it looks a little bit crazy. Yeah, it definitely, it just got out of hand. There was supposed to be a single box between these games that they were going to blow up, but they actually got too many records for that one, so they ended up having kind of, they had the big box, and towards the end of the game, people just started flinging the records that they couldn't get into it onto the field. So, already you're starting to see the crowd get a little bit rowdy. And it just really wasn't, it, it started to get a little bit sour towards, like, I, I believe they were saying the sixth inning of the first game. And this was made a lot worse whenever Steve Dahl came out in full military garb and a helmet and started hyping up the crowd, talking about, like, the murder of disco and long live rock and roll and just getting people into it. He, like, he was just full on hyping up this crowd. Because, you know, rock and roll is all about the military-industrial complex. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put on a uniform. Especially, like, during the Vietnam War. Like, that's, that's just a good idea. Anyway, whenever they, when the moment came, multiple rounds of explosives were used to turn the box into a smoldering crater. The crowd went absolutely wild. And I'm, I'm just looking at this, and it's like, that's not a good thing for that field. There's just parts everywhere. There's a smoldering thing. Like, the, the grounds crew is getting ready to go out there and start fixing it. But there's definitely visible damage to this field because it wasn't just one charge. It was like five or six charges, one after another, after another, after another, blowing these records apart and just sending shrapnel everywhere. I, this is somewhat of a tangent, but you mentioned the grounds crew, and I recently heard a talk about how specifically they curate those baseball diamonds and how, like, the slant of the paint line on some of those is a strategic choice by the groundskeeper to make it easier for their team and harder for the other team because they'll be used to playing on the certain type of field that's definitely uh, yeah. a, a big thing in baseball like you you want every little percentage that can go your way some uh some places have it so that the grass is going to roll like uh, catch the ball a little bit more so it gets caught up more in like by the short stops there's so many different things you can do with ch altering the grass altering the dirt altering the lines that will make it so that your team knows how to play on it better than other teams. So I, I'm just imagining these guys who have spent, I'm sure weeks, you know, basically this is their job is to make sure this baseball diamond is a work of art and also technically helpful to their team. And they're blowing holes in it to get back at disco. Yep. <laughs> and after this explosion, Steve Dahl rode off the field in a golf cart. Like he's just standing on the back of the golf cart, waving at everybody like a Roman hero during a triumph. And little did he know. Did he have the guy whispering in his ear telling him that he was mortal? Because I don't think that this guy ever had any uh, anyone to put his ego in check. Basically, I think he needed that was, guy. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you are still mortal. But he didn't know that this was just the start of the disco demolition that was to come. Normally, a crowd only has a single game and sometimes only seven innings for which to get drunk. Because of the nature of the double header and the fact that beer was a dollar, this crowd formed kind of an inebriated horde that only and was only emboldened by the explosive display in front of them. Like whenever you go to say a Rockies game, like what I would go to, they cut you off in the seventh inning. People are still drunk, but they're like they they don't have a whole night to just keep going and keep going and keep going. So this was just a special concoction that led to some bad ideas. 
Before the second game of the doubleheader could start, a few fans charged second base, sliding into it like their favorite players. <laughs> like they they just like they just sprinted out and just slid in. They they went at a completely wrong angle. It wasn't a very convincing slide, but it was it was kind of the catalyst that started this whole chain reaction of people deciding that it was time to get on the field. And whenever you already have a swollen stadium where there's no sitting room, you've got twenty thousand people standing trying to find something to do. And naturally, it just became this wash of people covering the entire field. White Sox pitcher uh, Ken Kravick was warming up when all this happened, and he just turns around and watches from the pitcher's mound as things grew out of control, as these people just started jumping over. And it it wasn't so much like a bunch of fighting. There was some like isolated fights or anything, but it was more of a party atmosphere. People climbed out, and they were just yelling about how much uh, disco sucks. Like They started to chant for it. There were people climbing the foul poles, which I don't know if, uh, if people who are unaware don't know. These foul poles go really high. One of the pictures, someone was at least 30, 40 feet high on this foul pole, just sliding down it afterwards. It's just a horrible situation. And before too much longer somebody decided it would be a good idea to light all this trash on fire. So, Oh, no. You have the field just covered in smoldering flames. Uh, you've got all these different banners and things in the stands getting set on fire. You've got a few people in each of these teams like sitting in the dugout watching all this happen. And all the while, you have legendary baseball announcer Harry Carey yelling over the loudspeakers, just trying to get people to go back to their seats for the love of baseball. You can just hear him imploring these people. And at I like to imagine, I don't know this guy, but I do like to imagine him, like, he just wants to see a baseball game. And he probably doesn't even dislike disco that much. This is just my image. He's like, fine, you guys blow up the disco records, whatever. And then it starts, he's like, I didn't even want it. Why? Yeah. We well, can't see another baseball game? Come on! And that's definitely his type of reaction to this. And he started singing, uh, like, a Take Me Out to the Ball game and everything over the loudspeaker, trying to get people back into the spirit. Oh, that's not going to work, yeah, Tony. I can just, tell you right now. It just really was not going to work. Uh, one of the teams was actually, I believe that this was the Detroit Tigers, they went back to their dugout, and they barred the door with, like, a 4 by 6 piece of wood, and they said that you could just hear thumping as people were trying to break down the door to get into the dugout to like uh, to get after them. On the other side of the field, uh, here's an account from one of the players. I came out of the locker room to the dugout, and I was sitting with uh, Ralph Gard and Lamar Johnson. They both had bats in their hands. The fans weren't as rowdy as much as they were just partying and running, running around. So I asked Lamar and Ralph, are you going to use the bats against those people? Uh, they were two of my best buddies in baseball. They said, if they come into the dugout, we are. So, like, these players aren't feeling safe. The referee is already, or the umpire is already just gone. There's only a few people that are actually uh, getting out on the field. And all the while, the scoreboard is very politely imploring you to please return to your seats. The field was destroyed. Craters, broken glass, shards of records and trash were everywhere. Bill Veek, the, uh, the owner that we were talking about earlier... I was down on the field tr trying to get people off, trying to get people into, like, to just get back into the stand so that they could start this thing. He knew that if they weren't able to get that, then they would end up having to uh, forfeit the game. And interesting thing about Bill Veek, he's a very bold guy, but he also only has one leg. And because of how torn up the field was and how wet it was, he was sinking into the dirt even more. So he was basically having to hop around this field. He's also kind of an interesting guy because he had an ashtray built into that peg leg. So... Just a cool dude, but this went completely out of his control. I'm, I'm imagining like a like a reformed pirate here. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Not super reformed though. Just like bought a baseball game with some of his booty. Yeah, yeah. It's like how you end up uh, getting Vikings to settle down. You just get them enough cash and let them retire. But uh, despite the will of this man, it would take 39 arrests and many people being injured before order could be restored. The Chicago PD came rolling in on horseback with clubs out, and the horde started to break down. A few of the players were describing this as watching the Red Seas part, because they'd seen what the Chicago PD was capable of a few years ago in some riots. And so seeing all these people rushing in on horses with their clubs out was enough to kind of disperse what they were getting into. It wasn't like they were there for great political reasons, they were just there to party. 
And at this point, it was determined that the game, uh, the game would not be able to be played because the field was just completely trashed. The grounds crew tried to get out there, and they had to re-chalk lines, and they were getting it ready, but the damage was just too great for them. So they decided to forfeit. And forfeits in Major League Baseball are exceedingly rare. Since 1970, there have been over 92,000 games, and only five have been forfeit. It's become rare in recent years, being that 1995 was the last time a game was forfeit, and I... This game was given to the Detroit, the Detroit Tigers without a single pitch being thrown. But they did manage to kill Disco, Tony. Yes, well, can confirm. It's a little bit debatable if this was the moment, but after this, a lot of Disco stations actually went back to being rock stations. And uh, the Bee Gees, uh, the people that wrote and performed Stayin' Alive, uh, blamed Steve Dahl for putting like the final coffin in, or the final nail in that coffin. And he thought that it was the biggest victory of his career. Which it kind of sucks, because Steve Dahl seems kind of like a jackass, and I hate him being able to claim any sort of victory like that. I was gonna say, it sounds like, despite how bad of, I mean, how badly this turned out from a logistical standpoint, he was able to get what he wanted done. He got, he got back at Disco. He got back at Disco, and he ran a very successful promotion, depending on what your terms of success are. They definitely sold a lot of tickets. They sold a lot of beer. But it, it, I believe it was uh, the other announcer that was with Harry Carey. They asked, well, do you think that the promotion was successful because they sold a lot? And he's like, he told the interviewer, no, you're stupid for asking me that question. <laughs> oh, I, that's the kind of honesty that Tony Southcott appreciates. Yes, I definitely appreciate that, so... I think that's all we have on the day the disco died or the disco demolition. If you guys have any comments on this or if you have uh, anything you want to say about it, put it in the YouTube comments or hit us up at uh, Human Echoes on Twitter. We will definitely take a look at those. If you have bad ideas for us, email them to badideasshow at gmail.com. And we will see you guys next week with another edition of Bad Ideas. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Bye.